everyone. This is Amanda. I'm with the Center on Brain Injury Research and Training. And today we are so happy to have Jim Wright, who's going to be joining us and talking about the role of SLP in multidisciplinary concussion management for adolescents experiencing prolonged concussion symptoms. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. For those of you who are live with me, please go ahead and take a look on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a chat function there. If you run into any questions, please use that chat function. I will be monitoring so that I can handle any questions that come up. Um, and then otherwise, uh, just hold your questions till the end um, and we'll get to them as we have a time. So um, with that said, Jim, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let you do um, introduction of yourself. Great, thanks, Amanda. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Wright, and I'm a doctoral student at the University of Oregon. So as, as she was saying, I'll be talking today about the role of the SLP in multi multidisciplinary concussion management for adolescents experiencing prolonged concussion symptoms, or PCS for short. A quick background on myself. I'm a person who stutters and clutters, so there may be a few times during this talk where I'm a bit disfluent and talking too fast. I'll do my, I'll do my, best, to I'll do my best to keep my speech rate controlled as slow as I can throughout the process. Um, on this slide, I share my disclosures. Um, nothing really major here. I'm just, a, you know, as I was saying, third year student at, at UO. I maintain a small grant internally from the university on my dissertation project, and I'm also an ASHA member. Uh, here are today's learning objectives. We have three for the presentation. The first one is to identify the required multidisciplinary practitioners for effective and coordinated concussion management. Our second objective is to describe the models for coordinating integrated care in different contexts, including school-based coordination and medical-to-school coordinated communication. And the third objective is to describe the range of, of available SLP-delivered treatment options to address ongoing symptoms disrupting return to learn, play, and community function. I want to share a few quick concussion facts as we get started. I'll begin with concussion epidemiology. According to the author cited on the bottom of this slide, every year there are 1.6 to 3.8 million concussions in the US. Concussion statistics are very often closely tied to sports, and annually there are, there are an estimated 300,000 sports-related concussions. On this slide, SRC stands for sports-related concussion. I also want to share that the most common cause of concussion in the age 15 to 24 demographic besides sports is motor vehicle accidents, which is shortened to MVA on the slide. Next, I want to share how concussion is defined in the literature. It is defined as the application of biomechanical force to the head and or neck via linear and or rotational acceleration that leads to observable changes in cognitive, somatic, and neurobehavioral functioning. So when a concussion does occur, it may result in a variety of symptoms. There are four symptom clusters for concussion, and those are physical and postural, cognitive, emotional, psychological, and sleep. Common examples of physical symptoms include headaches, fatigue, nausea, and dizziness. Common cognitive symptoms often include disruptions in processing time, memory, or attention. Psychological emotional symptoms may include heightened levels of depression or anxiety. And lastly, symptoms tied to sleep include difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or napping too frequently. As SLPs, we tend to focus on the cognitive symptoms. However, it's very important to note that cognitive symptoms often co-occur with symptoms from other symptom clusters and are often exacerbated by the presence of other symptoms, such as anxiety, difficulty sleeping, or headaches. It's important to specify that for most concussion cases, the person will recover and the person will recover and, and no longer experience symptoms anywhere from 10 days to three months. It's a very small proportion of cases that go on to develop prolonged concussion symptoms, or PCS for short. So let's define what PCS is. The acronym itself at first stood for post-concussion syndrome. It then shifted to persistent concussion symptoms 
and now to prolonged concussion symptoms. The shift in the literature to the terms persistent and prolonged occurred as it is believed that the terminology of the condition itself can contribute to symptom duration. Terms such as persistent and prolonged are reinforcing to the to patients that their symptoms are not going to last forever. So PCS occurs in 10 to 15% of all, of all annual concussions in the US, and it is diagnosed as the presence of three or more symptoms at three months post-injury. So as SLPs, we are interested in treating the prolonged cognitive symptoms post-concussion. This graphic represents the variety of factors that may mediate these cognitive, uh, cognitive difficulties post-concussion. At the tip of the iceberg are the visible things that we treat, the specific cognitive domains of attention, memory, and executive functioning skills. However, these skills are often impacted by the factors below the surface. The factors below the surface develop based on the person's pre-injury demeanor and post-injury psychological response to the injury. Therefore, it is imperative that our interventions address these below the surface factors to successfully impact the cognitive challenges above the surface. I really enjoy uh, this graphic. It displays what is called the biopsychosocial conceptualization of PCS developed by Silverberg and Iverson in their paper from 2011. Using this model, the etiology of PCS is characterized as an interaction between the following three factors. Um, the person's pre-injury pre characteristics, the context of the injury, and lastly, the person's post-injury response to their symptoms. That first graph can be kind of hard to interpret. So this slide attempts to make things a, little, a bit more easier to, uh, to read and kind of and comprehend. So that first bucket, the pre-injury factors, those represent the personal differences we all develop with, such as our, such as our um, genetic makeup or social circle that can influence the response to an injury. Three consistent pre-injury factors um, in, uh, that predict PCS include female gender, history of previous concussions, and psychological history of depression or anxiety. I would also add that in teenagers, um, history of school challenges can also really predict PCS. For our second bucket, injury-related factors um, relate to the injury itself, um, including severity of symptoms at the time of the injury and the context the injury occurred in. Then lastly, our third bucket, post-injury factors represent the person's psychological response to the injury and, the, and their ability to cope with the, with the experience of their symptoms. Often clients report the prolongation of symptoms due to the, no, due to the nocebo effect, which occurs when a person perceives they have symptoms simply because they sustain a concussion and believe they will not improve. Another common post-injury factor that drives symptom prolongation is the misattribution of symptoms. This occurs when a person attributes the symptoms or difficulties they are experiencing to the concussion instead of another pre-existing factor such as depression or anxiety. I have one more graphic to show on how PCS develops, and this comes from a paper, uh, Kenzie et al. 2017, and provides an alternative description to developing PCS called the multi-scale framework of concussion. So in this framework, there are four scales that contribute to concussion injury and recovery. Those scales are cellular, network, experiential, and social. At the cellular scale, we have the events of the neurometabolic cascade that occur at post-concussion, such as ion imbalance, metabolic dysfunction, energy crisis, and changes in blood flow post-injury. The purpose of the network scale right here is to highlight the, the neuronal pathways and connections that exist within our brain. Following the injury, the brain is forced to make alternative connections based upon the extent of the injury at the, at the, at the, at the cellular scale. If specified networks are impacted by the injury, certain symptoms may arise tied to cognition, balance, or sleep. The, the disruptions at the network scale lead to the, <laughs> lead to the, the scale, the scale experiential scale up here, the third one. 
um, and this is uh, this is where the individual experiences the concussion through, through through the presence of symptoms. Then, lastly, we arrive at the social scale, which encompasses the manner in which the interactions and relationships with other people impact the person's injury or recovery. What's unique about this representation is that factors from each scale may impact each other to create feedback loops. And this process does not, does not necessarily happen, uh, have, um, have to occur in a, in a linear progression. So for example, the development of headaches due to changes at the, at the cellular and network scales manifest at the exper experiential scale. The presence of headaches at the exp experiential scale may increase stress also at this same scale. As stress goes up, a feedback loop may, may be created that, that prolonged changes at the cellular and network scales that drives the experience of headaches. I also want to point out that on the outside of the system are the external factors. On the left, on the left side, we have the injury context and pre-injury personal characteristics. And on the right, we have interventions that impact the system during recovery. Across from left to right, is the ongoing environment the person experiences every day. I really like this visual because it provides a different way of understanding the many factors that contribute to PCS development. And it also identifies why it's important for all of us, regardless of our role, to be aware, to be aware of which scales are most, are most significantly driving the feedback loop. As SLPs, we tend to focus on the, on the Exp experiential and social scales, which are the behaviors the, the person is presenting with. What's important though, to strengthen our knowledge of the network and cellular scales to better understand what may be causing what the person is experiencing and how those experiences continue the, continue the loop. I'm going to shift gears now and talk more about concussion management. The goal of this slide is to represent that siloed healthcare and concussion management does not work. In our case, to effectively manage the cognitive symptoms, SLPs need to be aware of how physical and psychological symptoms are contributing to the prolongation of symptoms. The same goes for teachers, physical therapists, athletic trainers, physicians, psychologists, and, and the person with the injury. Education is very key. And the more practitioners in various disciplines can learn from can learn from each other's practice, it will allow for the reinforcement of intervention and ultimately quicker symptom resolution for the person. So here in Eugene, here's, here's the entire slide. There we go. So here in Eugene, this is our approach to multidisciplinary concussion management through the Eugene Concussion Management Team, or CMT for short. Not every CMT will look like this, but general team members consist of a doctor, a neuropsychologist, athletic trainer, speech pathologist, physical therapist, and a school coordinator. On our team, the physician up at the top sees all concussion cases for both sports and non-sports con non -sports concussions in our county, which is about 40 per month. Then 10% of these cases are identified to be at risk for, for PCS development, by the physician and are referred to the neuropsychologist right here in this box for testing and education on concussion recovery. She then refers to these team members based on patient need. So it could be to the physical therapist, could be to CAG rehab at our clinic, um, could be to CBER for, for school coordination, could be to mental health for to address depression or anxiety post-injury, and lastly, could be to neurology to address chronic symptom management and headaches. So these are two timelines, what happens currently and what we hope will happen with integrated care. The goal is to decrease the number of individuals experiencing symptoms at the prolonged stage by one, providing appropriate early management, two, providing individual supports and therapy for those in this category, and three, increasing communication and coordination with multidisciplinary practitioners to ensure appropriate services are being provided to manage, to, to manage the person's most impactful symptoms. On this slide, I share what I believe are the essential requirements for establishing integrated multi, multidisciplinary care. 
First, it's essential to have a team lead who coordinates meetings and facilitates communication between providers. On our team, the lead is a neuropsychologist. Second, it is essential to have a range of disciplines to treat the variety of symptoms people with PCS may experience. Our full treatment team includes seven different types of practitioners spread across six different locations, including a co-located physician and pediatric neuropsychologist, a clinical psychologist and a group practice, a pediatric neurologist and a group practice, a group of physical therapists and a private practice, two, two educational consultants that work, that work either for the school district or the state and provide TBI education and oversight on, in, in the schools. And our team lastly includes four SLP supervisors and their, and their student clinicians in their, in, their in their outpatient clinic on campus. Other essential factors include an interest in, in concussion management, the development of a shared consent system to ease the process of sharing clinical documentation and information, and a system for reviewing progress. Within our team, the neuropsychologist obtains a release form during the first appointment to share, to share, to share information with all providers the student is referred to. We then meet monthly to review cases. So I'm going to shift gears now and discuss how SLPs can treat PCS in adolescence. I will first discuss the literature sources on, on concussion management in this area, and then present the results of our, of our retrospective case series on, on the treatment of, of adolescents with PCS from our clinic. So beginning, well, so beginning with the, beginning with the, uh, with the sources for, for, teen, for teen concussion management, there is lacking literature specific to the treatment of prolonged cognitive symptoms post-concussion. Therefore, SLPs must rely on four different sources of literature to guide treatment in this area. Those sources include, one, physician statements on school concussion management, two, neuropsychology treatment literature, three, adult cog rehab by SLPs, and four, pediatric cog rehab by SLPs. Beginning with our first one, uh, position statements on school concussion management, these center on the requirements to properly develop and implement return to learn guidelines, often shortened to RTL. The three common themes among these, uh, among these statements are, the first that RTL guidelines should include a gradual return to activity where return to learn is completed prior to the student returning to play or RTP for short. Second, that the student should avoid total cognitive rest. A majority of guidelines stress that students should, should be encouraged to return to school at a level in which they can tolerate 30 to 45 minutes of cognitive stimulation without being too symptomatic. And lastly, it is imperative to have early identification and implementation of academic accommodations and symptom monitoring in the school for the student when, when, they, when they return to school. On this slide, I show one example of return to learn guidelines developed by Dr. Jerry Joya. The goal of this five stage RTL process is to get students back into the classroom at their pre-injury level. Students may start at any step based on their symptoms, but the goal is to reach step five, a full return to school. As you can see, total rest is not included in this model. Instead, Dr. Joya recommends total rest for at most one to three days after the injury before gradually returning the student to school at a level they can tolerate. Ideally, the student will gradually be able to take on more work and require less rest breaks and accommodations until they are back to their complete pre-injury level. Now on this slide, I'm showing, I'm showing Siebert's RTL guidelines I'm from here at UO. It's a bit more detailed than, than the Joya five-stage model, but the goal is similar in that the student will, will transition through each stage, taking on more and more work to rebuild their cognitive endurance as they make a full return. Again, progression is individual and depends on the student's symptoms, which will dictate, one, how long they stay at one step, two, 
if they're ready to move up, if they're, if they're, if they're ready to move, to move, move to the next step, or three, if they need to move back a step for, uh, 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 if, they need, if they need to move back a step. So besides the development of RTL guidelines, position statements on concussion management stress the importance of multi multidisciplinary participation. Ideally, there should be communication and coordination between medical and school personnel to ensure the student successfully recovers and returns to the classroom. Second, because there's a general lack of concussion knowledge and its effects on student learning across teachers and other school faculty, it's important to provide consistent education on concussion and methods to support students during their recovery. Specific to speech pathologists, various position statements have identified the SLP as a vital member of the, of the team. Such roles identified for the SLP include, one, the assessment of students' cognitive needs, two, the oversight, uh, oversight of the, or, or overseeing the imp implementation of, of accommodations, and three, and three being symptom tracking for these students. I'm gonna go now to our second literature source, uh, which comes from the neuropsychology literature for treating patients with PCS. This literature source stresses the importance of practitioners to have knowledge of concussion and the various causes of PCS that I previously outlined with the biopsychosocial model. The main treatment component from this literature includes psychoeducation, emphasizing support for the client and providing reassurance for their recovery. This literature specifically encourages the clinicians to target behavioral health, which may include such things like sleep hygiene, reducing screen time, increasing activity level, cognitive restructuring, and developing better coping skills. This literature source also provides caution for potential iatrogenic effects of mediating PCS. Iatrogenic effects occur as a result of treatment and may, exacerbate, and may exacerbate or lengthen PCS because the client is made aware of potential symptoms. So for example, prescribing complete rest until the client is asymptomatic may cause the, may cause the client to report more symptoms. Also, how we label and diagnose may have an adverse effect on how the client perceives their symptoms. That's why there continues to be a shift in terminology from syndrome to persistent to prolonged, messaging can have a significant impact on how the client responds to their symptoms and to treatment. For our third source of literature for adolescent, uh, for, for adolescent concussion management, this comes from the literature basis on adult cog rehab by SLPs. Specifically, this literature demonstrates positive outcomes on such measurements as the DCAFs, the BRIEF, and the KCBI by targeting the cognitive domains of working memory and executive functioning with interventions including metacognitive strategy instruction, which is MSI for short, the training of assistive technology for cognition, which is ATC for short, and lastly, psychoeducation. And then lastly, our fourth source of literature comes from the Pediatric Cog Rehab by SLPs. Um, uh, this literature source um, mainly works on such, on such populations as moderate to severe TBI and people um, and, and patients post-cancer. Successful interventions were identified on pre-post st standardized assessment through a combination of metacognitive strategy instruction and cognitive drilling targets, uh, uh, cognitive drilling activities to target the cognitive domains of attention, working memory, and executive functioning. I am now going to discuss how SLPs can treat PCS in, in adolescence by presenting the results of a case series con con conducted by my, by my advisor and I from the spring of 2018 to the summer of 2019. Our paper was recently accepted and, and published in the Journal of Topics, of Topics Language Disorders, and, and, our, and, and the title is Identifying Key Therapy Ingredients SLPs Need to Know to Help Students with, with, with Persistent Cognitive Effects Return to Learn After Concussion, Irrespective Case Series Analysis. So 
So our case series included a review of the treatment of 15 students in our clinic on campus. We used clinical data mining to extract, analyze, and interpret the existing clinical data into the following four categories. Actually, there they are. Yes, there they are. Uh, the first being student characteristics. The second being SLP tre treatment parameters. The third, clinical outcomes following SLP intervention. And the last one, multidisciplinary communication frequency and modality with the SLP. Our goal in conducting this review was to explore return to learn in the absence of a co-located multidisciplinary clinic. We performed this review because we believe, we, we believe literature was lacking on specific treatment provided by SLPs for, for adolescents experiencing PCS. A quick point on the context of the clinic the students were treated in. Our clinic is a graduate training facility where graduate, where graduate student, students provided treatment and were, and were supervised by one of four SLPs. All adolescent students were referred by a pediatric neuropsychologist who oversaw our local concussion management team and provided initial testing, education, and referrals appropriate uh, to, to appropriate practitioners based on the student's symptoms. Our team held monthly meetings to review cases that could, be, that could be tended by over the phone. So our first data category is student characteristics. Of the 15 students, eight were female and seven were male, ages 12 to 18 years old. Injury etiology included nine sports injuries, three falls, two motor vehicle accidents, and one assault. The modal duration of time from their injury until we treated them was four months, and all students were in the chronic stage of symptoms, which again is greater than three months post-injury. We wanted to explore the PCS predictors I discussed earlier. So 10 of the students had sustained at least one prior concussion and five had a history of depression or anxiety. Um, a bit more on those predicting factors. 12, 12 of the students reported symptoms and all three symptom categories we included, which was cognitive, somatic, and psychological. As I said earlier, sleep is often its own category, but for the sake of this project, we included it in the, in the somatic symptom category. And then lastly, three students received academic, um, academic accommodations to support their recovery, while nine were placed on 504 plans and two had IEPs. Moving on to the second category, SLP treatment, in which in this, in this, this category, we specifically extracted data on treatment dosage, therapy goals, and therapy approach to treatment. For dosage, the average number of sessions attended was nine with a range of four to 19. Uh, this slide breaks down the student goals we worked on for each student. So each student's goals were categorized into two corresponding areas. The first was the cognitive target, which was, which was executive functioning for 10 students and attention for five students. The second category was the academic goal that was developed to correspond to the cognitive target. Two students in the case series developed two separate goals targeting, targeting executive functioning which is why there were 17 total goals for the 15 students included. So there were 12 goals for, for executive functioning for, across 10 students, and then five goals, five goals targeting attention for five students. So on the orange part of the pie graph, this is the executive functioning self-regulation targets. Um, such goals included increased, increased assignment completion that was targeted with five students, improved grades that was targeted with four students, improved school attendance that was targeted with two students, and then lastly, reduced screen time compared to assignment completion targeted in one student. Now on the blue, uh, on the blue side of the pie are our attention goals. Um, such goals included increased retention of lecture, of, of, of lecture material and verbal instruction that was targeted with four students and increased reading comprehension targeted with one student.
So all 15 students in the case series were provided intervention to manage cognitive symptoms, which often included a combination of more than one approach to treatment. The two most common approaches to treatment were the training of metacognitive strategies that was used with, that was used with 11 students and a training of assistive technology for cognition, which was, which was used with eight students in the case series. One student did receive direct, direct, direct attention training. To address psychological, psych psychological concerns believed to be interacting with the student's cognitive symptoms, we provided personalized psychoeducation to 10 of the students. And then lastly, to address somatic symptoms, we instructed three students on how to, uh, on how to track their symptoms for triggers and trends, while one student was trained on a sleep hygiene protocol. So when developing these goals, we first reviewed the, the cognitive testing and neuropsychological, neuropsychological report that was sent to us with their referral. We also reviewed available school records. Then the process becomes very collaborative with the student um, using the following three key questions. The first one being, what do you want to change about, about school right now? The second question, what do you think is getting in the way? And the third question, what parts of school are going well right now since your injury? This slide provides more specific detail on the types of strategies and technology that were used with the 15 students in the case series. For metacognitive strategies, the most common approach was the use of internal self-talk or verbal, or, verbal, or verbal mediation, which was used with six of the students in the case series. This strategy is where students are instructed to re-auditorize information to themselves as they coach themselves through a certain situation. This is the type of strategy that appears broader, but it can be scaled down and personalized to the student's needs. So for example, students were taught the process of internal self-talk to help walk themselves through the process for both goals related to attention and executive functioning, specifically, specifically, retaining, specifically retaining class lecture and completing homework. The ultimate goal of teaching this strategy, like all of COG Rehab, is promoting the process of self-regulation, which we do through dynamic coaching. Some other strategies used for MSI in that category was reading comprehension and, and retention strategies that was done with four students, a prediction strategy that was used with two, a test planning sequence used with two students, a test study strategy used with one student, then lastly, a visualization, and mood regulation used with one student each. On the other side of the slide, uh, I'm sharing um, types, of, types of activities tied to ATC. Uh, the most common approach was training students on the use of either a paper or electronic calendar, which was done with five students. It's not so much training the students on how, on how to use their device as their cognitive deficits aren't so severe, but more so training the, but training the routine of using the calendar to remain organized and to complete homework on time. And some other ATC uh, things we used in, in, in the case series included a task, task initiation chart with one student, a smart pen for lectures used with one student, and the Apple iOS screen time feature corresponding to homework completion. This slide shows the psychoeducation themes we used across the 15 students in the case series. Similar to therapeutic approach, a combination of, psych of psychoeducation themes was provided to students um, across each one. So going through each one of these, seven students received education on the expectation for improvement. This theme is really essential for students who feel stuck and believe they will not, and believe they will not get better. I, I, this one kind of ties into that um, from back a, a few slides back, the uh, no no SIBO effect. The thought that I can't get better, concussions concussions forever, I'm stuck like this, you know, it's permanent, I, I, want, I, I want to improve. It's, it's trying to break that thought pattern by reinforcing that, no, concussion is very transient process. It will get better and, 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 and trying to change, change how they approach the injury and their recovery. 
Six students received education on the link between anxiety and cognitive symptoms. This theme is essential for students whose anxiety strongly mediates their cognitive challenges post-concussion. I find this theme really, really useful. I'll, 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 a lot of the clients I work with in the clinic on our campus post-concussion often have this pre-injury and post-injury history, like, pre-injury history of anxiety and, and post-injury heightened anxiety that really kind of drives their experience of symptoms. So trying to help, trying to help them, uh, trying to help them understand what their main factor is driving the symptoms. So, so this thing really ties into the uh, the idea of misattribution, helping the client realize that they're what they're going through might not be might not be all the concussion. It could be some other previous concern like like depression or anxiety, and helping them realize what's really the main problem. Um, two students received education on the link between sleep and cognitive symptoms. This theme is essential for students who report chronic sleep challenges and need to develop better sleep behavior patterns. This one is also really, really important. Sleep is often disrupted post-concussion and it's, it's, it's getting the client on a better sleep habit routine is really, really useful. And then the last theme, six students received education on the importance of increasing activity level. Also a very important theme, post-injury. So the, so the literature has shifted away from the, from the original consensus to encourage prolonged physical and cognitive rest. It is now agreed that following con a concussion, a person should return to activity sooner at a level they can tolerate. There are no worse outcomes for experiencing symptoms. We need to encourage clients that they can still be active at some level while experiencing symptoms, and that the more they are willing to push themselves to expand their threshold of what they can tolerate, they are likely to experience and report a quicker recovery of their symptoms. To measure progress on strategy use and implementation, we included in-session measurement benchmarks that either included fluency and accuracy for using specific strategies or devices, or the ability to reflect on trends and triggers of the symptoms. Overall outcome measurement in the case series from treatment was measured with the following types of impact data. We used student GPA compared pre post treatment, school attendance and homework completion. I learned in this process that using GPA as, as, as a benchmark is kind of volatile and a bit dangerous because GPA can be thrown off by so many things. So I don't always encourage doing that. I, I would say rather than, rather than doing total GPA, pick one class, do one class, one grade, and, and if that be your goal, then the entire um, course, then 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 students' entire course schedule. On this slide, we're displaying the types of measurement we used with the 15 students in the case series. A goal attainment scale, GAS for short, was developed for eight students that includes the development of a goal hierarchy. Five of these GAS goals targeted homework completion, two targeted attention retention of school material and one targeted school attendance. All students achieved expected progress or better on their goal hierarchies. Another common type of measurement was the use of rating scales to measure the perceived effect or the perceived usage and effectiveness of tools or strategies. Three of the students reported high ratings at, at the conclusion of treatment, but it didn't necessarily translate into outcomes for school. Another type of measurement was data obtained from the school, uh, a parent, or a tool. Such goals with, the, with these measurement plans included school attendance, improved grades, and the iOS screen time tracker. All five of these students met their goals. In this process, we learned that the iOS screen time tracker is a great way to, to promote self-monitoring. The one student using this measurement decreased her daily phone screen time by two and a half hours at the end of treatment while simultaneously increasing her homework completion. And the last type of measurement we used was pretest post-test data. Um, both students using this type of are using this method obtained significant improvement on the post-test. One of these students on a reading comprehension measurement and the other on the headache impact test, HIT for short, which measures perceived headache severity. On to our last data category, um, which is multi, multi, multidisciplinary communication. Um, 
To provide some context again of our team, we have seven practitioners in six different locations. The students included in the study came from, came from seven high schools and two middle schools across three districts in one county. The most frequent communication for the SLP was observed to be with the, with the neuropsychologist and the least with the physical therapist as the PT and SLP shared the least number of students for treatment. Included here are some examples of how maintaining communication with other disciplines informed our practice. We were better prepared to reinforce students on how to, on how to manage, their, on how manage their headaches due to communication with the neuropsychologist, physical therapist, and neurologist. And due to consistent communication with the clinical psychologist, we were better prepared to navigate a difficult situation in which a parent didn't mind their child wasn't going to school. Overall, the challenges these students and families face are very complex and may feel, may feel at times that they fall outside the scope of our practice as SLPs. But by developing the infrastructure to maintain communication and collaboration between disciplines, we can better be, we can better, be better prepared to take on the complexities of these cases. These next two slides provide examples of how goal attainment scaling um, is developed and how they look. The primary advantage of goal attainment scaling is being able to scale and measure progress on personalized goals that are important and meaningful to the client by delineating possible levels of progress towards their selected goal. Typically, goal hierarchies are generated with five equidistant discrete levels, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two, where minus one represents baseline performance and zero represents expected improvement following treatment. Plus one and plus two correspond to better than expected improvement and best possible improvement. Minus one corresponds to less than, less than, less than effective improvement so since the person would stay at baseline. And minus two corresponds to much less than expected improvement following treatment. When following specific gas procedures, Goal hierarchies can, can be generated that, that allow valid, valid and reliable measurement of progress on specific functional goals that are meaningful to students and allow progress for different goals to be compared. So in this first example, the student was working on the goal is to improve their grades by inputting their assignments into their, into their, into their Google Calendar. So at baseline, they're doing it twice per week. The goal, is to do it, the goal was, to do three, was to do three days per week. So as you can see, each level is equidistant. Which is which again is the goal of goal is the goal of goal attainment scaling, and in this example, the goal for the student was to increase her ability to recall classroom content in her in her, in her geometry class. So at baseline, she was doing it one day a week. The goal is to get to two days per week. So again, the, the key for gas being that being that each level is is equidistant across each across each level of the goal. So in, in the time I have left, I will, I will discuss how, the, how literature for, for adolescent concussion management and the results of our case series provide the foundation of, of, clin of clinical pathways for treating prolonged cognitive symptoms post-concussion in teenagers. This slide details the components that, that are necessary to treating PCS. First, it is essential to, to utilize motiv motiv motivational interviewing to develop client-centered goals. We believe that motivational interviewing can successfully be completed by focusing on three key questions. One being, what do you want to change? Two, what, what are the obstacles to making, that ha to making this happen? And three, what are your strengths since the injury? Second, it is essential to provide early and ongoing psychoeducation to support the student's recovery. It's important to adapt psychoeducation to personalized needs such as stressing the importance of being more active, understanding the effect anxiety has on cognitive symptoms, or developing better behavioral health patterns, such as sleep hygiene or decreasing screen time. Third, a therapeutic approach should be selected to match the student's profile. We believe this can best be accomplished through a combination of metacognitive strategy instruction and assistive technology for cognition aligned to the student's cognitive and academic needs. Recall that with this population, self-awareness is pretty well intact. 
The problem is self-regulation, which is commonly exacerbated by pre-injury learning challenges and difficulty succeeding in school. The rationale to select metacognitive strategy instruction is for students targeting the cognitive skills of attention, working memory, and executive functioning. When implementing metacognitive strategy instruction, it's imperative to ensure the student understands the purpose of their strategy and when it should be used. It's then important to consistently probe the student's knowledge of the steps to use their strategy, measure how often they use it, and measure their perception of its, of its, of its effectiveness and helpfulness. The rationale to select a such analogy for cognition is for students targeting the cognitive skills of attention, working memory, and self-regulation. A such a technology for cognition is very useful for students who need, who need support on organizational skills and can be implemented for goals to increase assignment completion. Similar to many cognitive strategy instruction, it's, imper it's imperative to consistently probe the student's knowledge on the steps to use their ATC device, a measure how often they use it, and measure perceived effectiveness. Again, metacognitive strategy instruction and assistive technology for cognition will often be implemented in combination with the same person. Fourth, you want to develop your, your measurement plan. As outlined in the case series, we promote the use of goal attainment scaling as it provides for the measurement of personalized goals that have discrete levels of progress. After all of these, we land on the fifth component, the outcome. The outcome should be personalized to what the, to, to what the student wants to achieve and must be able to and must be able to be must be able to be tied to your measurement plan and treatment selection. With students, it's best to keep the outcome tied to, tied to academics, whether it's whether whether, whether it's, it's an ability to improve retention of classroom lecture, increase homework, increase homework completion, or improve grades. So I will now walk through the pathway for two for two specific cases from the case series. The first case is a 16-year-old male who sustained a concussion in a car accident. He reported no prior concussions and no history of depression or anxiety. His prolonged symptoms included headaches, sleep difficulty, and anxiety towards his symptoms and recovery. In terms of cognitive symptoms, his complaints were in, were in the domain of executive functioning and self-regulation, manifested by poor school attendance. The student had a 504 plan in place to allow for, for to allow for a reduced school schedule, however, he consistently didn't go to school or leave school early due to feeling overwhelmed or struggling with his symptoms. This inability to remain in school began to negatively affect his grades. Beginning with step one, uh, motivational interviewing, the three key questions revealed this information. Beginning with our first question, what do you want to change? This student stated he wanted to return to his pre-injury performance and get back to what he perceived to be his normal self. Our second question, what is getting in the way? He stated, he stated his anxiety towards symptoms and school attendance was his, biggest was his biggest obstacle. And lastly, our third question, what is, what is going well for you and what are your strengths? He reported that his ability to engage in school and complete homework when he was there um, was not a problem for him. The next step was to identify and consistently provide a common message of psychoeducation to this student. First, we decided it was essential to reinforce education on concussion recovery and establish the expectation that his symptoms are not permanent. This client reported challenges with his sleeping, so we, can, so we consistently provided psychoeducation on developing better sleep habits and how poor sleep behavior may be impacting his, his ability to remain in school all day. The third message of, psycho of psychoeducation was the importance of reactivation. This student had significantly reduced his, his, activ his activity level since his injury, and both he and his mother were hesitant for him, to, for him to become more active again due to fear of our injury. We provided messaging that the best way to return to pre-injury performance was to increase his activity level and rebuild his threshold to level that he, uh, that he could tolerate. 
So in step three, we are trying to determine the appropriate therapeutic approach considering his profile. It's first important to consider what, what is the cognitive target they need to improve and what is their level of motivation to engage in treatment. For this student, his self-awareness was very high, but he lacked the consistent ability to self-regulate. This corresponded to his high level of motivation. However, he kept, it, he kept his, as he would say, get stuck. He often said he felt as though life had just gotten more challenging since his injury. So therefore, we decided that the, that the best approach would be to implement metacognitive strategy instruction with him, specifically the strategies of, of internal self-talk and a self-monitoring strategy. The rationale for this intervention was that it is appropriate to target self-regulation and it would allow the student to, con to continuously reflect on his performance. In session, the student was instructed on the purpose of the strategy, the steps to, the steps to use it, and the, and the context in which it would be helpful. Ensuing sessions probe the student's maintenance of knowing, of, not, of knowing the strategy steps, as well as measuring weekly use of it and its perceived effectiveness. So in step four, our measurement plan, we developed a goal attainment scale for this student centered around school attendance. As you can see, each level is equidistant where the minus one level is the current baseline and the zero level is the expected level of outcome following treatment. For this student, we, our goal is to increase his, his weekly school attendance from two hours a day, five days a week to three hours a day, five days per week. Then on to step five, the outcome. This student achieved the goal by, by the end of the treatment, by, the, by, the end of treatment by, by making it to level zero. He was seen in our clinic last school year and was dismissed when, when the school year concluded. The plan for this school year and, and, and the 1920 year was to return to school at a, was, was, was returned to a full-time regular school day. Our second case is another 16 year old male who sustained his concussion playing football. He reported two previous concussions and a history of depression and anxiety. His prolonged symptoms included headaches, fatigue, and ongoing anxiety that was, that was exacerbated since the injury. Cognitive symptoms included challenges in executive functioning and self-regulation, which manifested in a decrease in grades following his injury. This student had pre-injury challenges with school and was never a very strong student before his concussion. However, this injury further, de further decreased his school performance. So beginning with step one, motivational interviewing, we identified that what, that, that, that what he wanted to change was to improve his grades. He believed that his ability to complete assignments on time was his biggest obstacle. And last, he believed his best strength was to take notes during history class, which was his, which was his, his favorite class in school. On to step two, psychoeducation. The student also benefited from consistent education on the expectation of recovery. He, he tended to catastrophize his situation. We had to consistently educate him that concussion recovery is transient, which combined with the second, with the second psycho, psychoeducation message, the link between anxiety and cognitive symptoms. With this student, it often seemed like the anxiety symptoms that were present before the injury and made worse after it were the primary driver of his prolonged cognitive symptoms post-concussion. So for him, we consistently encouraged him to seek mental health treatment and problem solved with him to, to determine if symptoms or challenges with school should be, should be attributed to, to his concussion or his anxiety. The last message of psychoeducation was, con was consistent discussion on whether or not he should return to playing football. It was not our intention to sway his decision one, one way or the other, but rather, but rather to lay out the pros and cons of each choice. This student was, was an offensive lineman who was, who was beginning to, to receive interest from colleges and, and potential scholarships. We discussed with him the positive outcome of, of, of attending college on a scholarship. We also discussed the positive outcome of returning to his sport 
as it would help him regain his social life and feel more connected to his teammates and his friends in school. When considering the, when, when considering the choice to, to not return to football, we discussed the risk of re-injury. When he was dismissed from treatment last year, he was leaning towards not playing football again during the school year. On to step three, selecting our therapeutic approach by considering the necessary cognitive target and student motivation. We identified that the student needed to improve his self-regulation and organizational skills. He reported he was motivated to recover. However, we learned from, his, from, from the student that he was quick to, to, to deflect accountability for his challenges in school. For example, there were a couple of instances he received a poor grade on a test or a quiz and quickly blamed his teacher for how it was graded instead of considering if he could be more, be more accountable for his grade but by spending more time studying. For the approach, we decided it was best to implement the training of, uh, the training of um, ATC, but particularly the use of, of, of the Google Calendar app to track all assignments with reminders. The rationale for, for selecting this approach was that, it, was that it is appropriate to target self-regulation, organization, and time management skills. The student was instructed on, on, how, to use, on how to use the app to input, assignments, uh, to, to, to input assignment due dates. Then weekly, his clinician would probe his maintenance of knowledge for, for these steps and then review his app to see how many assignments were, 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 input, were input into his calendar. The clinician and the student would then measure how many of these assignments were completed. Here's a plan for the student, which again was a goal attainment scale, measuring the, measuring the number of assignments input into his, into, his, into his Google Calendar. We established his baseline to be the ability to put all assignments in, in, into, his, into his app two days per week, with the expected outcome to be three days per week. This student achieved level zero by the, by the end of treatment, um, inputting all assignments into his app three days per week. The larger impact measurement was comparing pre-post GPA before and after treatment, which he increased from 1.83 to 2.17. He was discharged following, following, the, following treatment um, last spring. So in conclusion, the pathway to treating adolescents with PCS should include these five components. The first being collaborative goal setting through, through motivational interviewing to, to identify challenges and develop meaningful goals to the student. Personalized psychoeducation to support the student's somatic or, or psychological symptoms. Uh, that's, our, that's our second one. The third being a toolbox with a range of cognitive strategies or ATC to use. The fourth being a measurement plan and five being the outcome. In the corner is my email address to, get, uh, to contact me. And on the following slides, I have examples of handouts um, for headache management on the first one, school attendance, sleep hygiene, and uh, types of thinking. So thanks guys, for, thanks guys for joining today. And are there any questions for Amanda that I can address before I finish up? I'm gonna switch back to the meeting now. Uh, thank you, Jim. Yeah. Uh, so everyone, this is your opportunity if you do have any questions that are specific to um, this talk uh, to go ahead and write that in on the right hand side of your screen. You can just select the chat option and write that in here. Um, and I would be happy to read that to him. Um, and um, everyone should have received a copy of these slides in a PDF via email. So if for some reason you did not, um, please email me. I, I it, it would be at perezA at Siebert.org. Okay, well, Jim, I'm not seeing any. Yeah, yeah, it seems that way. Um, and if they have questions for you, is there a way that they can contact you? Did you? Yes, it's them? on. It's on the once. I'll go back to back to my screen sharing. It's um, one second. It's on slide number fifty-five in the corner. It's my email address. Okay. Jim Rye, we didn't get the T. Huh? I know, no T. It's really annoying. That's classic, <laughs> classic UO right there. It's, uh, yeah, no T. J Rye, J Rye, 16. Yeah, uh, pretty, right? pretty, pretty annoying. So no T and no, yeah, in the email address. Okay. All right. Well, then um, we will leave it at that. Thank you again so much for your time. And I'm going to go ahead.